So good morning. This is Travel Daily, inspiring women in travel Asia. And I'm Caroline Tapkin. And today I'm joined by Susie and Rachel, who are in Laos and have a very interesting story to tell us. So Susie and Rachel, over to you. Tell us who you are, what you do and how you got there. <laughs> good afternoon. So I'm Susie and I'm the the co-founder and CEO of Lao Buffalo Dairy. We're in Luang Prabang, Lao. It's a beautiful UNESCO heritage city. Um, and I'm Rachel. I am also co-founder, but I am the executive chef and chief taster at Lao Buffalo Dairy. That sounds like a good job, chief taster. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, tell us, people want that one. <laughs> <laughs> how on earth did you get to, where are you from? How did you get to Lao? And what's with the buffaloes? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> I'm I'm from the U.S. originally, um, but I was in Singapore as a technically as a, t a trailing spouse. Okay. I'm from corporate world. I'm from Australia originally, but I've travelled and lived in Asia for quite a while. Um, and I was in commercial property, and this is a collective midlife crisis. Yeah. Um, and Rachel has is a chef, and so she had great skills from food and beverage. I had the commercial sales side and we decided, and I had worked in corporate for almost 20 years, and we thought we had traveled to Luang Prabang from Singapore on a holiday, loved it, but never thought we were going to be living here. Went back to Singapore, had our little midlife crisis, thought let's go to Laos for one year, that was eight years ago, and um, to just show our children something different. Laos is a very different part of the world. And let's run a guest house, see what it's like. Maybe let's look at opening a hotel because my husband's in construction and we thought we had complementary skill sets. And, but probably we'll just go back to real life, back in the world somewhere. And we had a chat with a friend shortly after we got here and we said, these are some of our ideas. And he heard Buffalo Dairy. Because when we first came to visit to see whether or not we thought we could come for a business aspect, we took a cooking class. And as we were going through the morning market with the chef, we said to him, where's your buffalo curd? And he looked at us and said, what are you talking about? We said, what do you mean? You've got all these buffalo, don't you milk them? And he stopped dead in the middle of the market and went, you can milk buffalo? <laughs> no culture of dairy in Laos, to put that perspective. And we looked at each other and said, we can do this, having no background in it whatsoever. No idea whatsoever. Have you ever milked a buffalo? Did you have? Did you ever milk a buffalo? Oh, no. we do. We have now. Yeah. We learned <laughs> on a YouTube video. Another part of the story. Um, but we then, at that point, thought, "Well, we'll run a guest house. That's probably something a little bit more up our alley directly." Uh, but again, Rachel was the chef. We wanted to do a really nice breakfast. We thought, "Let's just." ask a farmer to sell us some buffalo milk and make this beautiful curd because buffalo milk is quite famous in Sri Lanka and obviously it's very famous in mozzarella from Italy and um, let's make this really delicious curd put on the breakfast menu but as we talked to farmers their reaction was the same like what are you talking about before we were here there, there, there was no dairy no functioning dairy here for cows either um, and in fact a lot of people when we said where do you think milk comes from? Their initial reaction was coconuts. Or the box. Or the box. Or, the box. Yes. or women. Or women. Yeah. Those are their three top yeah. answers. Buffaloes and cows <laughs> didn't even get in the top three. Uh, we went, oh, okay. So then we thought, all right, well, if it's not going to be as easy as just buying some milk, perhaps we could show farmers how to just milk their own buffalo. And that was where we got up a YouTube video of people milking buffalo and said, well, we could do this. Let's just go find a farmer who seems keen and we'll get down the business end and, you know, here we go. So that was how we originally learned. <laughs> but then we also realised it's, it's not that easy. And for farmers here, it's more subsistence farming. The average household might have anywhere between one to five animals, but they're busy doing lots of different things. And to then milk the buffalo at this point, which was eight years ago, was just a step too far. Um, and so we came up with an idea that, okay, we wanted the farmers to earn an extra income. That was the point that buffaloes are underutilized. They just walk around 
having babies, which are then eventually the males will be sold for meat. But the females give no milk and the farmer, he only gets paid when he sells his buffalo. And there's lots of things that can happen whilst that animal grows. But if he was selling milk, he could earn an income along the way. And my background was in serviced offices, so renting office space. So I thought if you can rent an office, you can rent a buffalo. So I proposed that we rent their female buffalo from them and they get an extra income stream. And then we would do the work of milking the buffalo, making the cheeses, which Rachel will talk about in a minute, uh, and the farmer would earn the extra income. And then the buffalo and the baby would go back to the farmer. And then when she was pregnant, ready to give birth again, she'd come back to us and it would be a cycle. And they would, on the way, we improved the mortality rate of calves, which is over 30% in the villages to less than 3% when they're born on our farm. So there's a much greater chance they get babies back in good condition. We obviously feed their animals the whole time they're at the farm. We vaccinate them to prevent diseases. Uh, so the farmer gets all those benefits and they get an income stream they've never had before. And then if you're wondering how this all relates to tourism, um, <laughs> it was underpinned by the fact that then Rachel developed Jesus, which I'll get, let her tell you all about. Um, and we would then sell those to the hotels and restaurants, which this is a tourist town. Uh, and we would have tourists come and do farm tour experiences and see what we were doing. Okay, so actually you never opened a guest house, or did you? We did. We did. Two and, and, then, and a half years. And as and we were years. doing that, we okay. then moved across to running the farm and then realised once we started to have a full-time farm and a guest house, we also have children, and you know they tend to be a full-time job, um, that we now had three full-time jobs and that perhaps something would need to go. So it was the guest house. Guess Nobody that. wanted our children, so we had to get rid of the guest house. <laughs> <laughs> How old were the children when you actually moved? Uh, ten, ten and eight. eight. So they've grown up in, in Laos? Correct. Correct. At a French-speaking school. Okay. All right. So um, tell us about the cheese. So in the beginning, we had to prove that we could actually get milk from the buffalo and that I could turn it into cheese. So mind you, I'm a chef, but I had never, ever made cheese before we started this. So we found a farmer who had three buffalo with babies, and we taught him how to milk the buffalo. And every day, Steve and Susie's husband would go and get the milk and bring it back to me here in town at the house. And about every three or four days, I'd have enough milk to try and make cheese. But if you happen to look online, you will not find a recipe for making cheese using buffalo milk cow's milk or goat's milk. So the milks are actually very different from one another and you can't use a cow or goat milk recipe to make buffalo milk, it doesn't work. So I'd spend a lot of time at home trying to make cheese with this very precious milk because you don't get very much from buffalo. It's not like having a cow and I'd cry on a regular basis. I'd cry about how it failed but you know, not really knowing what I needed to do to change it to make it work. I'd experiment a little more the next time and cry again. And finally, I, I got so fed up with crying that I Googled every single dairy I could find worldwide that was making buffalo milk mozzarella. And I poured this sob story into an email to every single, tried to explain to them that we weren't competition for anyone else out there in the world. We were this tiny little place in the middle of nowhere, and we were just trying to help farmers improve their life. And in the long run, we wanted cheese because you know, we want cheese. Yes. My daughter's called Brie, spelled B-R-I-E, like the cheese. So you can see the driving force here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so out of those 15 dairies, one person in Australia was nice enough to email me back. And through a whole long email of her telling me, I can give you my recipe, but it's not going to work, which made me cry. She gave me her recipe and explained to me why her specific recipe wouldn't work, but it would get me closer. And she was right. It didn't work, but it got me much closer than I had already been. And eventually at the end of our six week trial, I had a perfect mozzarella ball after doing more and more experiments. But after seven years, our product range now is? We have mozzarella, ricotta, feta, blue cheese, yogurt, ice cream, cakes, all made with buffalo milk and buffalo cheese. We've done some experimenting with camembert, um, but currently we need some more breathing spare 
aging space. Once we get that, we'll add camembert, brie, um, cheddar, and Parmesan to the masses. Wow, that's that's quite a menu there. Yes. And buffalo milk is quite different. It's got higher fat content, which is why it makes such delicious cheese, but it has less cholesterol. And because of the protein makeup, quite a few people who might have power milk allergies can manage buffalo milk. So it's quite a unique milk from that perspective. Um, but it is super delicious, makes yeah. very delicious ice creams. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really, really good for making cheese. Um, but you do get a lot less milk from a water buffalo than you'd get from your average dairy cow. Okay, but so how, how long did it take to come up with the first cheese? The first well, the mozzarella, the mozzarella was really the first cheese. And as a result of the way from the mozzarella, you can make ricotta. So uh, mozzarella, ricotta, and yogurt were the first three. Ice cream, I've been making ice cream for more years than I'll tell you, because that might tell my age. <laughs> um, so that was an easy one as well. Um, and then we just tried some other cheeses along the way, and feta came out of it. And then I blue said, cheese. you know, we really want blue. So let's see. Let's see. It's very it's delicious. We get a lot of the chefs from the hotel and restaurants who also joined, uh, particularly at the beginning, and gave feedback on what they wanted and what worked well for them. Um, and so we tried to incorporate all of that. Uh, we're trying to be really environmentally friendly in terms of the packaging. So it's all, you know, we bring it into the chefs in town and then they send it, send back the containers. So we didn't have to have throwaway containers. So everything we do, we try to be as environmentally friendly as possible. Um, but in terms of the ice cream, Rachel's being very modest, we make traditional, like some local flavours that are unusual, lemongrass, ginger, um, plus your, your your regular ones. In um, high season, we have 17 flavors on the go. Apple pie. 17. Apple pie. We make our own Baileys, which we then make into ice cream. We do uh, matcha for the Japanese. We do an oolong tea, black sesame. sesame. And we're, the Lao, it's really interesting because if you ask most Lao people, do they like milk or cheese? The answer will be no. Uh, but if you then say something, but do you like pizza or do you like ice cream? The answer will be yes. So there's still a bit of a disconnect between dairy and where it pops up in your food. But our ice cream has become quite famous. We situated the farm on the road between Luang Prabang, the UNESCO heritage town, and Kongsi Waterfall, which is quite a well-known, beautiful, famous waterfall that pretty much everyone who comes to Luang Prabang will visit the waterfall. So as part of their trip, and we worked with the travel agents to make it part of people's itinerary. Um, and the ice cream became very famous. Everybody stops at least for the ice cream. And then we added to that doing farm tours and farm experiences to what they could come and do at the farm and cooking classes, making mozzarella cheese. And then that expanded again because that helped uh, underpin, we do farmer training. So it's the way that we rent the buffalo. We'll bring an eight month pregnant buffalo to the farm. She'll, we, before quarantine was sexy, we used to have, we quarantine the animals before they come into the main herd. We make sure they're vaccinated. We check for things like it could be passed on through the milk, like tuberculosis or brucellosis. Then they'll go from quarantine to the main farm. They'll have their calf. We're also quite different to most dairies in that we don't milk the calf for the first couple of weeks and we don't separate them from their mother. So after a couple of weeks, we will milk the mother once a day but the baby drinks from the mother the rest of the day and then after about a lactation period milking period of about six months they will go back to their mother to their farmer the farmer's paid the baby goes back so the baby still belongs to the farmer um as i mentioned it we helped with the mortality rates of the calves we also helped with breeding and this was in something that we learned along the way um because obviously that's their major function as a female buffalo is to produce more buffaloes that can be sold for the males to be sold for meat. Um, but unfortunately in Laos, because they've started to mechanize, buffalo were primarily used for working in the rice fields. But as they started to mechanize, and there's more and more of an industry for meat in this region, and they, they have malnutrition here is 30%, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but they sold so many of their male animals that they actually inadvertently started to inbreed. 
so the genetics wasn't that fantastic, which causes other issues. So we now have a breeding program on the farm. So whilst the buffalo is on our farm and she comes back in the heat, we will put her with bulls that have got better genetics and different genetics. So when she goes back, she's pregnant again, but we're injecting better genetics back into the village. Um, she then goes back, she's around two months pregnant. When she's eight months pregnant, she comes back and the process starts again. And every time they bring a buffalo to the farm, we pay them the equivalent of a month's salary, which is now just an additional salary, additional income for them, because they didn't have to work for it all. In fact, we did all the work. It's just a, it was an underutilized resource. It's like having a house and not renting it out. Now they rent it out and they get income. But we make the house nicer. It's like we're the best tenants ever. We paint <laughs> it and do it up. Um, brand new furniture. Brand new furniture and everything. And so, but we did realize that when these animals were going back to the farmers, that some of their animal husbandry knowledge wasn't spectacular. So where we do our tours, we call it our mini farm. That's also where we actually do training for farmers, practical training for our farmers and ideas on how they can better keep their animals, not just buffalo, but pigs and rabbits and chickens um, in a more environmentally sustainable way uh, with better feed options, better ways of using the manure and the like, compost, um, healthier and cleaner areas for their animals. And so we actually, we show them how to do it. And then that was underpinned by tourists coming and experiencing the tours of our farms, which helped us with our farmer training, which was free. As part of the craziness of setting up the mini farm, Susie actually put the pigsty right next to the cafe between her, the cafe and her office. And Stephen and I looked at her and said, you're absolutely nuts. But because of the way we do it, you don't smell it. So it actually works very well. We use something that, I mean, I Googled it. I'm the, the expert on Google. Um, and I Googled better ways to keep, to keep pigs and livestock. And old rice husks or goatee husks or things like that, if you put it in for the bedding quite deeply, it actually, because pigs are super clean animals, it absorbs the manure, but also absorbs the smell keeps the animal cleaner and by extension healthier so the farmer has less issues with the animal getting sick and then after a few months you can pull all of that out and you have spectacular organic compost for your gardens which of course all farmers also have their gardens so by demonstrating it rather than just telling them to do it they believed it they could see that it was less smelly which means they could build this closer to their houses they could use they all rice they could use their leftover rice husks they could use leftover products from crops at certain times of the year. So we tried to make it a circular farming concept and showed them by doing. And have you, you've learned all this from Google? Very much. <laughs> Along the way, thankfully we knew we knew nothing. We were totally admitted that. And so we did get some great support from um, some vets from overseas who came to help us and some organizations who, although they thought we were entirely crazy, when we said, look, we really want to help farmers, but at the same time, particularly, I guess, with a business background, you've got to have a product. You've got to have something you can sell. You can't keep asking for money to keep something going. So if the farmer could benefit, the animal could benefit, the environment could benefit, and we could make a business model out of it, underpinned entirely really by tourism, then everybody was a winner. Um, and we then talked to some agencies and uh, some German groups and they sent some experts over on an ongoing basis certainly at the beginning to help us with that animal side. We worked a lot with the agricultural colleges and universities and hired graduates and then had our experts train them, sent them to Thailand for training but we've learned a lot along the way. I mean even the experts they wanted traditional ways of dairy where the animals separated from the mother, you raise the baby separately and you you know milk the mother twice a day for a variety of reasons we really didn't like that model so one particular was that if the mother and the baby were separated when the mother went back with the baby into the village herd she didn't know who to follow because she didn't know who her mum was so that didn't really work for the farmers and the way they raised their animals so we changed the process and didn't separate them and only milked them once a day and funnily enough our milk yield didn't fall um, and then we've, you know, done more and more things on the tourism product side from, and then it developed, do you want to do the nutrition side? <laughs> it developed into 
two different nutrition programs. We, uh, we worked with the Swiss Red Cross in the beginning to give us an introduction into some villages where the malnutrition rates for children are, as Susie said earlier, approximately 30% before the age of two. Um, and it's all because of some of the superstitions that they have here in Laos, of what they can eat, what they can't eat, when they're pregnant, when they're nursing, after the baby's born, so. And too much reliance on rice, mm -hmm. not enough nutrients. So what we've done is we've gone into the villages essentially and said, you know, you have this resource at your fingertips. Let us teach you how to use it in a more economical way. We've gone in and we've taught them about better animal husbandry to start with. We've helped them to vaccinate their animals. We've taught them how to milk their buffalo. And then we've given them recipes and helped them to learn how to cook the milk so that it's not, you know, there's no bad bugs in it. It's all pasteurized. And they can impart the nutrition from the milk to their entire family. One of the easiest ways is if they get 500 ml every day of buffalo milk, they all make rice. So if you put it in your rice cook pot, you effectively pasteurize it when you're cooking your rice. And then you have the nutrition from the milk along with the rice, in, well, inside the rice, and you feed it to your family. And, and it's easy. It's easy. And it's not stepping outside of the comfort zone from something that you don't know how to do. You're just putting it in what you're already making. And this has and all soups and and soups. Like yep. this has all morphed into a second uh, nutrition program help, uh, sponsored by the World Bank and the Poverty Reduction Fund here in Laos that we've gone into villages with goats, with goats and done the same exact thing with goats. Fantastic. I mean, so what, what challenges have you experienced along the way? I mean, you've, you've talked a little bit about the... the what haven't you? <laughs> yeah, what haven't you? Give me some of the top challenges that you've experienced. To be honest, at the beginning, the farmers were pretty sure we were going to barbecue their buffalo. Um, and so when I said, just rent your buffalo to me, I'll give you the income. It's, it's worth, you know, almost 50% of the income they'll take home in a year. So they've never heard about it. Our farm looks very different now to what it did eight years ago, i.e. there is a farm <laughs> versus there wasn't one. Uh, when we first said, yeah, just, you know, bring a buffalo over, we'll just milk it. Um, so it was actually really hard and everybody thought we were insane. So it, we had to actually get some of our own buffaloes at the beginning. We just couldn't get enough people to rent a buffalo. But pre-COVID, that had grown from, you know, we, were, we bought 10 of our own and we rented, I think, 10, to we had over 158 buffalo that were on the farm. So it's it, quite a sizable farm. And we were now working with, you know, 20 villages, and about 200 plus people, sorry, 200 more farmers across those villages that wanted to rent buffaloes to us. So um, overcoming the skepticism is one of the things. What, what others have you come across? Have you, have you experienced anything because you're women trying to do this, for instance? Um, yes, I mean, Lao's not overt, I guess, in terms of, I mean, women, they, they run their own chips here, but there is that normal, you know, there's the expectation there'll be a man somewhere lurking about. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, I mean, I'm the CEO and Rachel's the chef. Um, and so that surprises them. But it hasn't been, I mean, yes, there are moments where it's, you know, my husband will be there and they'll go to talk to him and he'll be like, looks at him. Yeah. They know the answer to the question you're trying to ask me right now. So it's more, you know, it's, it's, not too overt, but you just have to laugh and, and roll with it. And I've worked in corporate life and senior positions in Japan and I'm like more than orthodox that. And you've talked as well about... And support. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say we try and support the women in the local community as well by having at least 50% of the staff of our team as, uh, being women. Yeah, even though... And what was interesting, actually, on that point, when we first started, anyone who, I mean, we didn't, we didn't speak loud. We still don't speak enough. And so we needed people to help us, to help us translate. And we've tried to get people who, I mean, there's no way they can know what we're doing because we don't know what we're doing. Um, and we needed someone to help translate. And it was only men who'd had that level of education that we needed mm -hmm. to be able to explain such a new concept. 
So then, of course, they were the first sort of managers. And then we said, but we want to hire women. And that reaction and always was the farm. You can't have women in a farm. And my reaction was, really? <laughs> Hello? <Yes. laughs> let's just ignore you said that and let's just hire some women anyway. So being very, when we get got candidates, because the candidates at the Agricultural College University, 40% of them were women. Mm. With the people we had at the beginning who had the English skills, they would have purely hired just men mm. had we not been here going. No. And, of course, begrudgingly they admitted that the women were very good with the animals, had more attention to detail and were more reliable. So we'd like to say that we're not anti-men, but we are very pro <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. And you've been working with the women, with the children and things as well in the villages to, to improve nutrition. So how, how has that been received? What challenges did you have there in the beginning? Scepticism, again, um, and overcoming. And I think like all of us, we're all guilty of this. Once you get to a certain age, trying a new food is like, oh. um, and so that was hard. So we really did have to come up with ways to sort of slip the milk in that wasn't too scary um, and then work with other NGOs and governments who were already doing quite a lot of nutrition programs. So instead of reinventing the wheel, there was already people talking nutrition. So we kind of slid in and said, right, well, we've just done a whole thing about nutrition and the fact you can't just eat rice, you need proteins, you need. So here, let's add milk to what you're already talking about so that it wasn't such a huge jump. Um, so we've tried to partner with people who are, you know, better at doing the other bits and then we can come in with this bit. So, so you work very closely with a lot of the NGOs working in the country. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they, I think as our farm developed, a lot of people who saw us day one, and I think, you know, if they were taking bets, they were betting against <laughs> us. Um, and they've told us that, honestly. But now as times progressed, and more farmers came on board and the breeding program worked. And this was actually a government breeding program that they hadn't been able to implement with different bulls and different uh, semen. So we learned about artificial insemination and all these sorts of things. And we successfully implemented it because the females came to the farm. We could manage the bulls and the um, artificial insemination because it's not that easy out in the village no. if, with nitrogen. It's, you know, tricky. Um, and so it works. So the breeding happens and then these animals go back the villages so the genetics goes back out into the villages as well um so as we started to actually get things done certainly government and ngos started to go oh okay they've just achieved something that we hadn't when they came to the farm and they saw the very first crossbreed we had that was a big shocker to all of them different type of buffalo mm. so crossbreed and it also has the main focus here for a farmer is I'm going to sell this animal for meat. But you can have good genetics, but if you don't feed it well, you won't get the potential. Same with animals and, and people, honestly. And when they saw that this genetics program, all of a sudden you've got animals that were going to be bigger and healthier and sell for more money. That also helps the enthusiasm of the farmers. They're like, wow, now I'm getting a regular income from the milk. Plus, I'm going to improve my income from the sale of the animals for meat. So it went from there. So you've really come <laughs> together the farming, the buffaloes, bringing the villagers in and linked it all to tourism and offering a tourist product and, and cheese and ice yeah. cream and everything else you're developing. So you've really brought the whole thing together. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Because the tourists also can't resist cuddling a buffalo. Yeah. Well, who could? You know, we, we, do, we do go for the, like, the cheap thrill of like washing a buffalo and milking a buffalo and having a selfie with Lola, yeah. who's one of our lovely buffaloes. You know, how could you resist? But, and by the same time, they're then supporting all of these things underneath it. So who inspired you at the very beginning? What inspired you? Who inspired you? Uh, <laughs> such a hard question <laughs> it is. I think it was great to be able the thing about having the midlife crisis was we call it having a purpose with 
uh, it was a uh, midlife lovely. crisis with a purpose rather than a Porsche in that we wanted to give back. And it sounds really corny sometimes when mm. you say it, but you get to a certain point that you think, gee, it would be nice having come from corporate life. And I worked with some very good companies, don't get me wrong, but to do something where you could actually see it through to the end and you could see that direct impact on people. Um, and it's so, I love that it's so touchy-feely. Like mm. you actually milk the buffalo, you get the cheese, you eat the cheese. Um, and that was what, and that you could help farmers and people along the way and in a practical, sustainable way. That's kind of what inspired us and it's just grown from there. And when you see some of the people that we're helping, I mean, we had, just as an example, one of our team members who is extremely, extremely poor and had two little children that she was constantly having to go to the hospital with because they were so malnourished. We finally just took over and said, let us help and started feeding them and playing with them. And the difference between day one when we met the children and what, two years later? Oh, they were such different, different kids. completely different kids. We also started English lessons. Yes. So we started English lessons originally for our team and then that expanded to kids of our team members and then that just expanded to kids from the local schools. So then we had a, almost a full-time English teacher to leave and uh, right through to 2020, yeah. it was only 2021 with COVID just made it impossible. But the children, we have two schools either side of us, a junior school and a high school, and they would come at lunchtime and have two sessions where they would get English lessons as well. Um, so And all free English lessons. So we don't mm -hmm. charge them anything. They come because they want to. They're not forced to do it. And it's just, it's fun. Do you ever sleep? <laughs> No. No. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> that was why the guest house, it was like, yeah, okay, we can't do all of these. Even um, even in our sleep, we dream about the farm. <laughs> I wake up dreaming about one. Yes. And quite often, actually, people come to the farm and say, why don't you do a homestay? And we just go, mm, 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 mm. nope, nope, nope. Not right now. <laughs> no, I, th I think you have your hands full. Um, and, and COVID certainly challenged us. I mean, we were, pre-COVID, I had said, look, it is all tourism-based. And with that comes the, you can have a bad year in tourism, never realizing how prophetic my work is going to be. Yeah. So we had started uh, working with Japan on exporting the cheese. And we'd been sending cheese and at the same time we sent it, they were supposed to have a big expo. And of course, just as we sent it, 300 kilos, um, COVID hit, expo got cancelled. And logistics here is challenging, but we've just had a train line open up into China. So exports are still something that we want to work on. Um, but tourism is what under, absolutely mm -hmm. underpinned everything. It was the hotels and restaurants that bought our cheese. It was the tourists that came to our farm. Um, so, you know, we would like tourism to re restart. Yeah. What, what would you have changed? Looking back now, what do you wish you'd done differently? Not made some of the mistakes we made, I guess. That's um, part of the process, though, isn't it? If you're yeah. really pioneers. Uh -huh. so, yeah. Along the way, we've had many people ask us to recreate what we have in different areas. And our response has always been, it's in our plans, but we need to finish making our mistakes here because they're costly before we go someplace else because we don't want to make the mistakes again. Yeah. Um, I think we, we possibly, I guess, maybe me more than Rachel, I'm a little bit impatient. Um, and with the benefit of hindsight, I probably should have spent more time trying to bring on board different governments and different agencies to start it with, because you obviously have a higher level of credibility with everyone, with the villagers you're trying to talk to, than just two random women walking in and saying, look, let's, here's a YouTube video. How hard can this be? Um, let's just try and milk this buffalo. And I think, you know, trying to get, it would have been easier if we had more people that were prepared to come and start with us and say, yeah, they're not crazy, let's give it a go. Because you just, that was really hard work, getting people on board with what we were trying to do. And we risked, we've risked it all. Mm. You know, we've financed this 100%. We've, you know, so. We sold our houses. Yeah. So You've really put everything into it. Yes. Mm. 
Yeah. But again, you, you are the pioneers. You have taught the agencies and the governments and everybody else what can be done. Mm. Uh, yeah. So what's but next for you? What's in the future? Uh, well, <laughs> yes. we, we have had without tourism to pivot a little bit. And uh, one of the things that we're doing is we are starting to, or we're going to start making soon, these emission control blocks, which are formulated to reduce the amount of methane that cattle and buffalo, and buffalo produce. produce. And we actually worked with an, with an Australian company who have been trialing these for two years, both in Mao and in Australia, and with the government here and universities. And obviously there's a lot of concern about methane production from cattle. And these blocks have been formulated so that one block over the period of you know, a year will reduce the amount of methane that this animal emits by up to one tonne. And these blocks can then be distributed to farmers to give to their animals. But it's a really unique pricing system in that we don't charge the farmer for the block because even if they wanted it, and again, they need to even understand the logic behind it, they probably couldn't afford it. So after a lot of work, and it's mostly our partner that's done this side of it, working with to get permission, they create a carbon credit. So every block that's distributed for free to a farmer creates a carbon credit that can be then sold, which funds the business. What is a block? So it's, a lot of people would think of like a lick block, or a mineral block for horses or salt lick block, something like that. But it's made of molasses and other ingredients and it's all been formulated so that it improves the um, digestion process of the animal. So they eat it? They eat it, correct. Um, and it's just a big block and it's hard and they lick it. And by doing that, they digest the different minerals and vitamins in it. It improves their digestion, helps. It's like a car runs on better pet. So reducing methane is as easy as that? I wouldn't yeah. use the word easy, <laughs> but it's certainly... <laughs> we don't like to do anything easy because that would be boring. Yeah. Um, but yes, that's the long and the short of it. And that will reduce the methane from these animals because these animals, they don't get great quality feed because that's the nature of the way that cattle production works. It's not really production, it's more subsistence. So by doing this, um, these animals are healthier, which means more of them survive and a bigger and we sell for more money for the farmer it improves the environment and then the, the model means that the farmer doesn't have to buy it that we the carbon credits can be sold and that's how it gets funded and so we've been helping set that factory up at our farm and sourcing the ingredients locally and we'll employ local people uh, so farmers will benefit by selling things that go into the blocks employment will be used and of course we know the farmers that need the blocks because we're renting their buffaloes so it's, it adds to the overall picture but it doesn't rely on tourism because i guess we we needed to diversify our revenue streams a little bit, a little bit. well hopefully tourism is coming back now it we seems can... to be it does yeah, seem slowly to. slowly yeah and i think people are very keen to travel i mean mm. there's that pent up please let's let's go but I, the interesting thing about it is i think for a lot of people this has been a big wake-up call and when they do go and spend their tourist dollar again i think they'll think about how they spend that tourist dollar um and so you know for the way our business operates we hope that will help encourage them to not just us there's a lot of social enterprises here in Loa and Prabang, and you know people just think twice about how they're spending their tourism money and looking to go somewhere <laughs> unique and different for experiences rather than just lying on a beach and spending money correct although i'd like to go lie on a beach please <laughs> yeah, me too, me. a warm one <laughs> okay, there's four thousand islands in the south of Lao, and that's a beautiful place for, for like swimming and lying out in the sun as well definitely part of the mix here in Lao. <laughs> Well, I mean, ladies, it's been fascinating talking to you and listening to, to your story. And I hope that tourism is restarting very soon for all of us and all of you. Um, and I look yeah, forward so to hearing the, the ongoing developments yeah. and products. It sounds as though you're not going to stop at cheese and methane blocks and <laughs> husbandry and, and nutrition. And 
there's much more in the pipeline there. Yeah, well, we, we think it should all come together. And to be honest, I mean, we the hotels and the restaurants and the, you know, all the people in the hotels who recommend people come. The people who come are happy with the hotel because they gave them a great, you know, something interesting to do. So we all work in very well together. It's all part of, you know, making the tourist experience. Well, it's a very small destination, isn't it? If you're not working together, nothing is going to work there. That's yeah. right. It amazed me when we first started here how so many of the hotels actually worked together, even mm -hmm. though they were competing with one another. Mm -hmm. But that, that's, I think that's traditional, especially in Asia. You tend to get that um, support network. Uh, mm -hmm. But bringing in things like farming and cheese and into that mix is not so usual. So drawing it all together in the way that you have done is certainly very inspirational. So thank you. Oh, one more thing. What advice would you give to some of the girls in Lang um, Lao and coming up and wanting to do something like you're doing? What advice would you give them? Just get on with something and learn from whatever it is. And because you don't know where it's gonna take you, and you'll learn things from, you know, different. I mean, I certainly learned a lot from my previous industry. Rachel has learned a lot. And that, so you, you do bring things in. So you don't need to be so fixated on what's the ultimate goal. I mean, if you know it, awesome, fantastic, go there. But I think the vast majority of us, certainly, I don't remember it, you know, when I could remember thinking at five years old, you're right, I'm going to be a buffalo farmer. No. <laughs> so I think just, Get the most out of what you can and don't be too scared to just give something. You know, I was, I'm always like, yep, let's just go over there. And my company knew that if they said, we want to send you in another country, I'm like, okay. Or we want to move you to another part of the business. Okay. Because it's an opportunity you know, to learn. You just learn so much. Yeah. So don't be scared by it. Just do mm. it. And you, you won't know how to do it. I mean, I was put in conference centers and I had no idea. Sure, I'll do it. No problems. Because you learn on the fly. Learn on the fly. Make it until you make it. That's really the advice. Say yes, then learn. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Absolutely. Google is wonderful for certain things. Yeah. Absolutely. And then know what you don't know and ask for help. Fantastic. And on that note, I think we will end it there. And thank you once again for sharing your story. And best of luck with the coming year. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we'll see you here one day. Oh, I have no doubt. <laughs> <laughs>